Um, Hugh uh, has been at the University of Otago on the South Island in New Zealand since 1994. He was first appointed to the Department of Anthropology that year and uh, was head of the sociology program from 2001 to 2005. From 2001 to 2010, he was also the director of the Center for Study of Agriculture, Food, and the Environment called CSAFE, and which is a multidisciplinary research center conducting research into the sustainability uh, at the interface of social and environmental sciences. In 2011, he was appointed chair in sociology and took up the position of head of the department of a new department of sociology, gender, and social work. His research for the last decade and a half has mainly focused on social dynamics involved in sustainable agriculture. He is one of the research leaders of the Agricultural Research Group on Sustainability called Argos, a program with a joint venture between the agribusiness, Lincoln University, and the University of Otago. So won't you please uh, help me welcome Professor Hugh Campbell. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rick. Um, I, I mean, I've really, uh, this has been my first time in Montana, and uh, it's been a really enjoyable time here. And uh, I mean, I, I've always, I've come to the United States a number of times, spent a number of sabbaticals, and always enjoyed the hospitality here. But I particularly enjoy intelligent hospitality. And what I've enjoyed in Bozeman and Missoula is intelligent hospitality. It's a great thing and a great asset. Now, I'm very pleased to see a good group of people out there. Uh, thanks for coming out on a, what for me seems like a ferocious midwinter day. And for you, it's probably, you know, the first caress of fall. I had a slightly embarrassing experience a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been doing a, you know, a slightly uh, sketchy speaker's tour around North America. And um, I was up at the UBC Okanagan campus in Kelowna. And I arrived with my colleague in the department to give my talk at 3.30. I arrived at 3 o'clock and the department chair just gave me this stricken look and said, you're who? I said, oh, I'm Hugh Campbell. I was scheduled to speak at 3.30. And he went, right, okay, let me just send an email. And uh, sure enough, uh, half an hour later, five members of the department turned up. Now, they were lovely. They are Canadian after all. Uh, the two of them left within half an hour, uh, but they promised me as they were walking out the door, being polite Canadians and all, that it wasn't because of the content of my talk. What I'm saying is that uh, you are free to leave halfway through if you really, really need to. But what, my aim is to make sure that you don't want to. Tonight, um, uh, in Rick's introduction, he described my time uh, 10 years as the director of CSAFE, uh, which was a fairly all-encompassing venture engaging with transdisciplinarity around sustainability issues, around, uh, you know, sort of some of the very specific science and interface problems around that. And then in the three years since I've stopped being director there, it's been a really uh, interesting opportunity for me to step back and think, well, you know, you got yourself immersed in a whole lot of very deep projects for about 10 years. How do you put that together into a wider narrative? And through having to essentially go back and start teaching undergrads again, uh, particularly a paper called The Global Politics of Food, uh, I had to sort of think about what is the current state of the world we're in. So tonight's talk really draws on three recent and edited collections that myself and colleagues have put together trying to capture something of the current moment. One about the world food crisis that started in 2008, one about agricultural policy regimes and the need to incorporate resilience into agriculture and sustainability, and a third one that's just come out about uh, the new politics of food waste. So tonight is about really trying to capture something of the bigger, uh, a bigger sense of where we're at. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Oh, very good. I'm glad you did that. The Canadians nodded too, but you know, maybe more passively. All right. <clears throat> so tonight I want to, being a sociologist, we like dabbling in history. So we're going to start with history and the Industrial Revolution and then go forward to my arguments as to why we're in a particular kind of crisis at the moment. Um, I characterise the way in which we face crises uh, of environment and economic development slightly differently to a lot of my colleagues. Uh, feel free to engage with that in question time, as the good, folk, the good agricultural economists in Bozeman did last night. 
Uh, I want to deal with uh, two case studies that we've been looking at recently, but they're not an exhaustive set of uh, things uh, uh, and issues around the world. Food crisis and asking the question, are we at the end of the era of cheap food? Uh, and then some of the new stuff around food waste and then draw some reflections about how we respond to that. I, I, at this stage in my career, I can't just pretend to be an academic sitting back and objectively watching other stuff happening and researching from some kind of distance. I think at some stage you've got to jump over the divide and realise that applied isn't something that we tack on to the end of our real academic work, that we are all inside the politics of research, especially in an area like sustainability. And we take positions whenever we, do, we choose a research question, and we, we are, in a sense, enacting outcomes all the time. So I don't make this kind of divide between you know, digging a garden to plant some veggies in the backyard or planting some trees up at our campsite and what I do as an academic. I, and I, I guess I'm encouraging you also not to think differently to that. All right, starting with history. The Industrial Revolution, as many of you will have learned throughout your, your schooling, that thing that started in England in the 1770s and began rolling forward in the 1800s was the most cataclysmic and transformative event that humankind has ever faced. The entire discipline of sociology was formed out of social theorists who were trying to understand the massive transformation that had happened in society, particularly in the first half of the 1800s. So it all starts really for me with the Industrial Revolution. Oh, does it? Because in actual fact, the Industrial Revolution really only is the consequent or enabled by a very significant agricultural revolution that took place what was called British high farming that took place, a series of innovations around rotational grazing strategies, new, a new sort of science of soil fertility, of stock and crop breeding, um, and new ways of approaching farming as a, as a new <clears throat> part of the sort of subset of this new interest in the sciences and rational approaches to doing things better. And the massive increase of productivity in English agriculture that happened through the 1700s, for a whole range of reasons, enables the growth of the industrial city. So you really start to see for the first time in history, people producing enough food that you can break out of basically having to about 90% of your population producing food. So there's something about this agricultural revolution that underpins the industrial revolution. And it, and it all goes really, really well for about 60 to 70 years. Well, it all goes really, really well from the perspective of driving forward the industrial revolution. For those of you more skeptical about whether this was a good idea or not, it goes in a catastrophic direction, but progressively for 60 to 70 years. The view of history that I take then changes quite dramatically from a lot of my peers. I think when we're involved in environmental politics, we're trying to engage now with issues that started back in the Industrial Revolution, things like climate change and things like that, are really things that have their roots right back in that time. And it's very easy to fall into a narrative of history where you, you go into a sort of a, the domino theory of history, that is a one damn thing after another happens. This happens, there's a consequence, there's a consequence, there's a consequence, and finally, like lemmings, we go off the cliff into environmental catastrophe. Um, and there was a great shakedown on planet Earth sometime late in the 21st century. That's what we call the linear view of history. That there's, a, there's a series of consequences that go forward and, and it's like a train out of control and eventually we all fall off the end. My view of history is dramatically different to that. I think in actual fact our economic history and our ecological history shows that we go through these periods of kind of stable growth and then we collapse into a crisis. And at the time of crisis, often things get mixed up quite significantly and we take quite a different trajectory and then we fall into a crisis again. To de demonstrate this, you know, Campbell's law of punctuated history, that's really not actually, um, what we have in the Industrial Revolution is tremendous growth and evolution of the new factory form of life, the new industrial societies, the new urban, the new urban populations, the new classes. And then in the 1840s, what historians have called the hungry 40s, it falls apart. And there's really a significant crisis uh, around uh, Western Europe in particular. Uh, it's driven, its most visible thing for plant scientists, of course, is the great potato blight. Uh, the Irish potato famine being the worst expression of that blight through Western Europe in 1845 and 1846. This, of course, has a transformative effect on the United States. as 1.2 million Irish people die in the, in the famine itself, and the rest that can get out migrate out to the United States. 
Uh, but in 1845, the potato famine was used as an excuse to repeal the Corn Laws, which were the protectionist principle at border that stopped British landowners from having to face competition from perfidious grain exporters around the world. Well, one perfidious grain exporter in particular, where I am now. And, uh, and the Corn Laws were repealed in 1845, and essentially the British Parliament said, we're open for business to a world market for food. You know, anyone can basically now export or, or we, we can import grain in from around the world to feed and try and solve this hunger problem. That, that they really are very worried at this time because it's not that long since the French Revolution, the British ruling, you know, the British political elite are sitting there, the British aristocracy are going, hmm, there's, you know, there's things like this, bread riots breaking out in Manchester and things like that. There's, they're not, unfortunately, they're not so, quite so concerned about starving Irish peasants. But they're worried there is going to be a bloody revolution in the 1840s uh, in, in Britain. And so, radical action, uh, what, what is the problem? The problem is that from the agricultural revolution prior to the 1770s, the local food systems of Europe have simply been unable to keep up with the exploding industrial population. So it all worked, all worked fine feeding ourselves from England and from France and from Germany and from the New England states, but now this new industrial population has outstripped that food supply. That is why we're in a crisis. The response is a radical and dramatic transformation of the world of food. Something that had a huge influence on this country, on places like New Zealand and Australia and Canada, Argentina, India, all around the world there is a, is a, there is a huge retooling of the colonial world, the imperial world, towards suddenly feeding the world from far-flung far flung places. So the transport revolution and shipping, canal building, railway buildings, new preservation technologies, make it possible to feed large populations of relatively poor people from food sources on the other side of the world. And whilst food has been transported around the world before the 1840s, it suddenly starts to happen as the fundamental principle of how the industrial world food feeds itself. <clears throat> right, I'm in full flow now. I'm just going to grab my cup here. My friends in Bozeman tell me this is the Marco Rubio manoeuvre. <laughs> yeah. Right, and I too will never be President of the United States. Probably because I was born in Kenya. All right, around the world, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm using the license of being a guest. <laughs> Your intelligent hospitality, remember I was priming you earlier about that, thanks. All right, so around the world we have this global food system starting to take shape around a new set of foods, a new style of farming, Places like New Zealand and Australia are transformed into these massive grasslands. The great forests of New Zealand are cut down to provide places to grow sheep. Uh, Argentina gets brought in as this massive beef producing colony. India gets turned into a grain producing basket. All to feed this seemingly insatiable need to feed these new industrial cities of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, New Zealand was known as Britain's farm in the South Pacific by the middle of the second half of the um, 19th century, the 1800s. Right. Oh, yes, this is one of history's less glorious figures, Bulwer Lytton, uh, Viceroy of India. Uh, his father was the uh, poet credited with the line, it was a dark and stormy night. For that, they were rewarded with being basically put in charge of the Indian colony. And he was tasked with essentially opening up the uh, Indian market to the world, Indian, Indian grain production out of the Indian peasantry to the world market. And uh, Mike Davis's magisterial book, Late Victorian Holocausts, links the opening up of this grain market with a series of devastating El Nino famines to create the, the dreadful situation where probably between 1860 and 18, 1895, probably about 20 to 30 million Indian peasants starved. So there were, you know, while, while the, the problem problem of feeding the new industrial city was being solved by empire, the implications for people at the edge of that who was only losing their food supply, of course, were extremely drastic. So here we have the, um, the Calcutta waterfront uh, with, um, uh, with the grain sacks all getting ready to go off to motherland. Uh, this new, what we call a food regime, this global food regime, uh, is going to last for about 70 to 80 years. It's going to be incredibly successful. So there's the uh, Union Stockyards in Chicago, which became this wonder of the industrial world, this uh, mechanism, because it wasn't just colonies. There were also extremely highly productive ex-colonies waiting to go, and uh, certainly the American Midwest was a major 
breadbasket for the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the novelist, the Victorian novelist Anthony Trollope, sat on the waterfront um, uh, with, uh, with the St Lawrence Seaway, with all the nose to tail ships carrying the grain going out, and described this river of grain flowing out of the Midwest towards England um, in the 1870s. Okay, Union Stockyards was a phenomenal, uh, uh, phenomenally significant historical development in, in world economic history. Uh, people used to come and see it as a tourist attraction, this newly mechanised way of processing meat carcasses. It was the invention of the new rail system where you hung the carcass up on this running rail and it went down the chain and everyone cut a bit off or did something and it went like this. And economic history, historical legend says that Henry Ford went down there and looked at it and had the eureka moment of saying, actually, if it runs this way to disassemble a carcass, couldn't we run it the other way around and assemble something like an automobile? Uh, so really that, that, that moment in the, in the massive need to create large amounts of food out of the colonial holdings in the Midwest, uh, driving a whole lot of other economic changes that are going on. So, excellent. A world food system based on the colonies is going to work. We've found the answer. Britain's got loyal colonies around the world that can feed it. America has a kind of an internal situation where the industrial states are fed by the farm states. Uh, various other participants seem to get it in the neck, but uh, they're probably not particularly important or they don't vote. It's all going fine as far as the rationale of the system goes, until it's not. Something starts, I mean, as, as this is beginning in more familiar territory historically for many of us, although this is not an area that I lived through, but you know, what, what you're seeing in the 1920s and 30s is that that new global food system based on a particular style of farming, based on a particular suite of commodities like wheat, the great industrial, durable, transportable grain, is starting to fall apart. Uh, soil systems are becoming stressed. You have the, you have, you know, the iconic imagery of the uh, US dust bowl effects. But around the world, in Australia, in the 1920s, red dust storms are blowing out of the interior as, as fragile soils that have been put under sheep pass, uh, been under, put under sh being grazed by sh for sheep. Uh, basically, those soils that have been sitting there for millennia being padded on by little marsupial paws meet cloven hooves for the first time. And those sheep just slice open that topsoil. It just begins to blow uh, in, into uh, cloaking cities like Sydney and red dust. New Zealand had a massive soil erosion problem beginning to elaborate in the 20s and 30s as the last vestiges of the root substructure of the trees that have been cut down in the 1880s has rotted away in the hills are starting to collapse. So there were signs ecologically that it's not really going very well. Of course, you'll be very familiar with the narrative of the Great Depression, the booms and busts in agricultural futures trading in the 1920s, the Great Crash in 29, the Great Depression, and it all begins to unravel horribly. Something happens then which will transform the way in which people politically engage with food. For a hundred years, since the 1840s, there has been no significant hunger in Europe. Western Europe, the new industrialising societies, they have solved their hunger problem for a hundred years. And then they haven't. Because the Second World War is going to make Western Europeans hungry again for the first time in a century. So through displa displacement of refugees, uh, through the German submarine fleet basically cutting off uh, Britain from its supplies and uh, sinking all the attempts to bring grain in from the colonies and from America. Um, the best efforts of uh, America to provide a grain resource to keep the war effort going there. At some stage in 1941 it looks like it's all going to fail and the war is going to be lost because, because the Western European food supply has collapsed. Inside Western Europe, mainly in Western Europe itself, um, countries have these massive refugee dislocations, they're living under occupation, the G Germany itself is being blockaded by the other powers, and essentially food runs out. <clears throat> this has a transformative effect on thinking about agricultural policy. So when we get to the end of the Second World War, all this has changed the equation completely. You're at the end of the Second World War, the United Nations is being formed, the FAO is being formed, the Cold War is about to really start to elaborate itself in the next few years. People are thinking that food system we relied on post the 1840s no longer works. That thing does not work. It was dangerously flawed. We can't be cut off from our food supply again. So you see the arrival of a very new policy discourse around food. The idea of food security, this, this new term is invented in the late 40s, 
And it's, food security now is used as a term to describe world hunger in other parts of the world. It shouldn't be. It was originally designed and, and used as a term to describe the food security needs of Western Europe itself. And it was, a, it was a term that was strongly encouraged by the United States because the United States saw itself as having a major role in providing food security for Western Europe over those upcoming years. So, a new regime forms. <clears throat> what does this new regime look like? It, looked like? it looks like every key dimension of the previous hundred years of food, the previous food regime, turned on its head. No longer a global food system feeding the industrial countries, the industrial countries are going to feed themselves. So you see this era of massive, the introduction of massive subsidisation of agriculture through things like the UK Agriculture Act in 1947, the Marshall Plan for Europe, refeeding and rebuilding Europe after the Second World War, 1959, you're starting to establish the common market in Europe. The, you, you see massive uh, focus, uh, particularly in the United States, on government programs to transform wartime industry into agricultural purposes. Tank factories become tractor factories. Um, chemical warfare manufacturing plants, which they were manufacturing even though they didn't use them, become pesticide factories. Explosive manufacturers become nitrate-based fertilizer production sites. So the, the great wartime companies that grew large within the Second World War become the great agribusiness companies of the 1950s. It's heavily subsidized, there are massive incentives to do it, and what we see is agriculture beginning to go down its new industrialization pathway, but it's inside the industrial countries themselves. So agriculture has come home, it's come back to places like England and France, and it's massively intensified in the United States. This really changes the, the world food equation very dramatically. By 1952, America is so productive in agriculture. There is so much grain being produced that a law is introduced, PL 480, the Food for Peace law, which makes it essentially creates this new mechanism for disposing of American grain through international aid transactions. So in 1952, PL 480 is instituted, and within a couple of years, 25% of the American grain harvest is being distributed as aid internationally, not actually traded in the world market which of course has interesting political outcomes for the countries that are receiving that grain uh, within the context of a, a, an increasingly heated Cold War, uh, and also is propping up the world market price for grain. Europe follows along this industrialization and intensification pathway, heavily subsidized, lots of incentives in there to intensify agriculture, industrialize it, and by the mid-60s, Europe has broken out of its food deficit situation and itself is starting to produce food surpluses, such that by the 1970s, the great common market, the European Union crisis will be, what do we do with all this surplus food? And so food by the 1970s, under the post-World War regime, the new let's basically start producing food for ourselves, that policy of food security for industrial countries spectacularly succeeds. By the 1970s, we have massive amounts of abundant, cheap food. So, first set of conclusions. The trajectory of global food relations, I mean, I'm arguing here that food is essential for how entire societies and, and global economies uh, um, develop, but it's not linear. It doesn't fall like a set of dominoes. There are periods of stable growth, periods of crisis and reconfiguration. So in the period between pre-1840s, post-1840s, 1940s, post-1940s, a world food system has configured, gone into crisis, and come out in a completely different form. You can see where I'm heading, can't you? So are we at one of those moments now? Are we in a, mo are we in a new crisis and reconstruction moment? which says there's something about the current moment which means that certainties that have been held in place since the 1950s are now no longer just taken for granted. I just don't know why those agricultural economists got upset with me last night. <clears throat> so, are we in a new crisis? I think that there's something about the economic basis of the... My argument's going to take place over three dimensions and two case studies, all right? 
There's something about the economic basis of food production and the regulation of food systems that's currently in crisis or potentially in a transformative situation. There's something about the ecological dynamics of food. Slightly harder to sell this one, but I'll have a go. There's something about ecological dynamics of food systems that's different now than what it has been for 60 years. The trajectory hasn't basically been good for 60 years, but I'm going to say it's even worse now than it has been for a while. Uh, and there's something about the social and cultural politics of food, which means that I think if I was doing a lecture on food politics 20 years ago, I wouldn't have quite had this number of people sitting in front of me. There's something we're, more, we're a little more switched on to food now, I think, than we were 20 years ago. It's a very glib statement, but uh, it's... So I better move on. All right, so I'm going to use two examples, the cheapness of food and issues around food waste. Now, this chap is a German economist called Eric Engels, uh, who came up with one bright idea, I believe, in his academic career, which was called Engels' Law. And it was, a, it, was, it was a reflection in the 1920s on the relative cost of food in the average household in countries. So Engels' Law is basically a series of economic, simple economic equations that, uh, that whilst the absolute amount of income being earned by households was increasing Rapidly, the amount we actually spent on food was only increasing at a much more gentle rate. As a result, the proportion of our income that we spent on food began going on this declining growth curve relative to our income. So relatively, food became cheaper and cheaper in our lives. And uh, the argument has been taken up around Engels' law that this cheapening of food right through the industrial, the, the industrial age, shall we say, um, has been a major driver of economic growth. It's liberated a huge amount of uh, other income for consumption, consuming other things, other goods, uh, and driven the, the elaboration of whole other sectors of economic activity because we no longer have to spend 50 or 60% of our income feeding ourselves. So Engels' law, I think, is a very interesting thing. Engels' law is char characterizes the industrial age as being one long sweeping, with a few blips there around the Great Depression, downward curve of, uh, of uh, the relative cost of food. So from the USDA figures here, uh, in 1930, at the start of the Great Depression, in American households, the average American household spent around a quarter of their income on food. Uh, by 2010, you're down under 10%. Uh, I think that Engels' law places the United States as relatively the cheapest food country in the world. Um, there's not many countries under 10%. I think New Zealand hovers around 16 or 17%. We're still pretty cheap. Uh, seen another way uh, to look at it in terms of relative to hours worked of the average worker in the average week. So for a basket of groceries, uh, at the end of World War I, it took nine and a half hours of work to buy a basket of groceries. By 2007, it's only 1.7 hours of work. So we've been in this massively long sweep of time under Engels' law where food has got relatively cheaper. And of course, you know, the thing about laws, economic laws, is that they never are disrupted. They go on forever, don't they? or until the oil runs out. All right, so this, this, I, I love this graph. This is from an FAO report uh, that, was put, that was done collaboratively with the OECD in 2007. Uh, and here they were projecting where world food prices um, were going to go in the next um, 10, years, uh, 10 years. And uh, of course, the trajectory is all downwards, because what we know is that in the long term, food prices always get cheaper. What really happened, of course, was that almost instantly we entered into this global food crisis in 2008. And it was not an expected event. The 2008 world food crisis took people by surprise with its severity and its extent. So uh, ignore all that stuff because I'm going to basically not agree with them in a couple of slides time. Uh, so here you are in about 2007 and then bang go up in 2008. Um, uh, the FAO food price index hits its all-time high since World War II in December 2010. Here it is whipping up the 2011 curve. Uh, if we used world grain prices, you can see it's actually been a triple bump. So there's 2011 and then coming into 2013. They're not identical on the causes of the three spikes, but I'm going to go into why I think they are related. But these are unprecedentedly high prices for global food commodities. The world food market is suddenly much, much more expensive than it has been since World War II. People generally buzz around these five things as the key causes of why we suddenly went into this massively new dynamic around world food. Um, so going through them one by one, there's no doubt that as uh, financial, what should we say, derivatives trading, 
uh, things that seem to sure bet back down here, like subprime mortgages, by here are starting to look more dodgy and a lot of uh, uh, financial investment is offset into food futures as something more stable. Now, there's been a number of people pursuing the food futures line as to how what effects this has, the general consensus seems to be that this new move, this new trend towards food futures trading in world markets is not so much driving up the price of food as accentuating the spike, making it much more rapid and going higher and then lower than it would have otherwise happened. And uh, of course in uh, food vulnerable populations, things like uh, in, in um, northern Africa and places like that, when things like the price of cooking oil trebled in six months, this was extremely disruptive. Second thing is climate change. So we have been through the period of these three spikes in a period of uh, a dramatic series of droughts. This is something that some of you may have picked up earlier this year. The Australian Bureau of Meteorology had to add a new colour to its map because it was starting to consistently get temperatures over 54 degrees centigrade in the, in the interior of Australia. 54 centigrade I think is 129 Fahrenheit. Uh, so but the absolute nature of the temperature is, is not as interesting as the, rel as the relative height of that temperature compared to what had previously been seen in Australia. So in Australia, this is from a couple of years before, you start to see the lowest rainfall on record being experienced in places. Uh, I used to live in this part of Australia. Uh, this area kind of around here is the grain basket of Australia. This is where this is, this is the, uh, that part of the Murray-Darling Basin, the River Rena, is where most of the grain comes from. So you see drought effects really hitting where you are producing grain. Um, this is uh, from this year, uh, something you'll be a lot more familiar with, although, you know, blessed states up in this part of the country seem to have escaped the worst of it. But again, the big drought that's been happening in the United States this year is hitting in some of the key grain producing areas. So what you're seeing is an, an increasing frequency of droughts happening where food is being produced or where the food for the world market is being produced. Biofuels got a lot of airplay at the time uh, as being a major contributor. I think of the five factors, it's possibly not as high as some of the others. I'll get to the ones I think that are high in a second. Um, but if you take the, there has no doubt there's been the, the monthly ethanol production by diverting corn into ethanol production has been increasing through from about 05 through to 08 at this time. Uh, but the price of corn uh, in, uh, on the exchange is going through, it's going through a similar spiking curve, but the correlation is not, it's not particularly strong. I'm not giving biofuels a free pass here. I think they contribute, they're just not the major contributor. They, are, they definitely are a slight contributor though. This is the one that has truly got agricultural economists worried. So USDA figures showing that this is China's corn, China's corn production. So in 2004, was it, China is exporting 15 million metric tons of corn. In 2009, uh, 2010, China is importing a million metric tons of corn. And it's a long-term structural shift in the ability of emerging economies like China and India to feed themselves with the technologies that they had been deploying increasingly since World War II. So that's a long-term structural change in the world grain market created by a billion of the world's citizens going from being participating in a country that was exporting corn to one that's now importing. That's a major driver of long-term change. And finally, a stunning correlation between the food price index and the average oil price. So we know that an intensive industrial agriculture is very, very closely linked to the price of fossil fuels. Um, there's a whole lot of different ways in which the cost of fossil fuels is implicated in the cost of agricultural production and in the cost of agricultural products and commodities. And in that first spike in particular, the 2008 one, oil was really a major, major driver. Uh, the consequences are very uh, dramatic around the world. Uh, an interesting analysis that was done around the food price spikes around I I incidences of civil unrest. So we see a number of the uh, old favourites in terms of uh, places where food insecurity has been a major issue for a long time. Uh, of course, there were very interesting high-profile ones like Tunisia, where a food riot around the world food crisis in 2000 it sparked the civil unrest that began the dominoes rolling towards the Arab Spring. Uh, of course, uh, commentators are not slow to point out that uh, by the time you get to 2011, Syria under food shortages had over 900 food riots. And this has been contributing to the destabilisation of these countries. Of course, it's not the only reason why Syria is a complete and utter mess at the moment, but it's definitely a contributing factor. But the, um, 
in the United States, the organisation that paid the most attention to this analysis, because the UN follows this very, very closely, and the FAO. What is the organisation in the United States that follows this most closely? It's the Pentagon. Yeah. They see this clear relationship between the ability, between constrictions and, 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 and disasters in the food supply and massive destabilisation of regions. Uh, love this photo out of a dire situation. There's a guy in Tunisia basically holding off the riot police armed with a baguette, a breadstick. He's uh, not to be advised. Anyway, they seem pretty unworried about it. Um, all right. The other thing that becomes a casualty in 2008, and we argued in a recent book we uh, put together, is that up until 2008, there was an increasing consensus that trade liberalisation, if pursued to its maximum extent, if the WTO was just allowed to get everyone together and all trade liberalisation emerges as planned or elaborates as planned, we're basically going to feed the world. 2008, I argue, and 2011 and 2013 says this is no longer a good idea. I'm not going to say it's a completely disastrously bad idea because nothing is either extremely one thing or the other, but this is no longer a model that can be used as the one-size-fits-all solution to world hunger. There are going to be some places that are going to be very well served by integration into world markets for food. Places like South Korea and that have been excellent examples of integration into world markets has done a reasonably okay job relative to others. There are other places where integration into world markets, like a whole string of North African countries and Middle Eastern countries at the moment, where it turned out to be that that urban population that had just moved out of basically producing your own food as peasants, moving into cities and becoming the urban poor, relying on fragile markets for key carbohydrates and oils, when those things suddenly spike in price, it's absolutely catastrophic. They would have been much better being peasants. They would have been much, much better off not being liberalised. Anyway, I'll come back to this in due course. I think it's quite an important point. So, if we are now, you can see where this is going, can't you? I mean, basically, if Engels' law has turned some kind of critical corner, if we're now in a situation where food prices aren't necessarily going to continue to get cheaper or horrors start to actually cycle upwards now, this has unthinkable consequences for how we think about the world economy and planet Earth. It, some good thinkable consequences and other disastrous unthinkable consequences. So, you know, the, the way in which we have undermined what was an emerging consensus, I didn't personally participate in that consensus, but the general consensus around what global trade policy should be is now, I think, seriously under threat. There hasn't been a successful conclusion of a WTO round well, basically since the battle in Seattle in 1999, uh, for a whole range of reasons. But this is part of the contribution, is that that solution wasn't providing, that, 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 that prescription wasn't providing the solution that a number of key countries, particularly the new BRICS countries, were looking for. We've had 170 years of economic growth through the Industrial Revolution, partly driven by the cheapening of food. If food starts to become more expensive, something else is going to give. Uh, we have the exacerbation of economic inequality leading most obviously into the civil unrest of food rights around the world, but potentially with implications here in our own home countries as well. Uh, our cultural relationship with food changes, as I'm going to go on and argue. There's this whole phenomenon now of land grabs as people are getting a little insecure about where their food supply is. There was a major land deal uh, announced, uh, what was it, between China and somewhere like uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan? It was one of those ex ex-Soviet states uh, out there about uh, obtaining massive amounts of farmland. The China problem comes up again. And the way in which we generate sustainable livelihoods from farming is we have to rethink the way in which we understand how that happens in places like New Zealand or Montana. All right. Okay, that's, the big, that's the big global crisis stuff. Something that connects, that I want to connect much more personally to us to take us through towards some conclusions is issues around what I call new food ecologies or new politics of food ecologies that I think are best demonstrated by issues around food waste. Since 2008, I think we are experiencing a sea change, slow tidal change, shall I say, on this one, but nevertheless quite an important one around how we understand food waste. Now, we've all known since we grew up that we were not supposed to leave food waste on it, 
plate waste. You know, our parents wanted us to eat everything on the plate because there were starving children in Africa and all that kind of stuff. We've grown up with food waste being this kind of thing. If you ask me in terms of ecological problems around agriculture, I would have identified food waste as being, you know, oh yeah, no, that's important. That's important. When we began to look more closely at food waste, you start to realize that it's a vastly, vastly bigger problem than I think people had realized. And we had really, we'd lost sight of what food waste was as an issue. Uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, uh, under EU pressure, an intergovernment agency in the UK began collecting data and conducting research on food waste in the UK, an organization called RAP. And the data they began producing in their reports was startling. And so people went out and did more data collection and just basically kept coming up with the same answers. It was really well out of the parameters of what I would have expected. Uh, food activist Tristram Stewart uh, produced this book, which some of you may have read. If you're of a melancholic temperament, uh, you find my talk up too upbeat. You want to go home and get really depressed, go onto Amazon. and Well, no, don't go onto Amazon. Go to your local bookseller <laughs> and uh, ask them to get a copy of this. It's a, it's a shocking read. Anyway, why is it shocking? For the following reason. Well, this is a book. This is not a book tour, by the way, but this one uh, we, we brought out a couple of months ago about this food waste issue. But Tristram Stewart comes up with this way, there's a series of shock stats, as I'd call them, about food waste. All right. As you may have heard, down your alternative media networks, in the UK, around 30% of food that is purchased is never consumed. Of course, in Missoula, the figure is nowhere near that high, but I suspect nationally across the entire United States, it'll be very interesting to find out what that figure was. So that's, that's from point of purchase. This is us as private consumers purchasing food. It's not fast food chains or retailers or restaurants or cafes. They're, they're in a different equation. One of the things I've been studying is new quality standards for suppliers that were sort of driving up the quality requirements to supply, you know, high-end supermarkets and uh, elite food stores and things like that. So Tesco's, the large uh, British supermarket chain, they had these very, very specific quality standards they brought in for carrots. You can't have bent carrots. Carrots have got to be straight of certain dimensions. And farmers would basically harvest their carrots, run them through this uh, visual semi-X-ray type machine, and they'd immediately be graded out. And, uh, and through those machines, around 27% of the carrot harvest were just graded straight back out be chopped up and ploughed back in. It's a very expensive form of fertiliser. So this, this is the, we're losing a lot of food at that, that extent. It gets really bad on things like salad mixes. So in really quality sensitive things like salad mixes, they're finding 75% of the vegetables that are grown, the salad greens that are grown for those mixes, never get eaten. So that's, what is, where does that take us? It takes us into a bad place. Oh, well, that's, that's a landfill in the UK. I found this a very shocking picture with all those kiwis being thrown out. Uh, but I'm sure they're low-grade Italian or Chilean kiwi fruit. <clears throat> no one would throw out a lovely zespri kiwi fruit from New Zealand. Mine, she looks excited to have found the pile of kiwis. All right. Tristan Stewart uses these, and I think this is becoming a wider narrative around our, our understanding of the ecologies of food, to sort of say, actually, this is, this, is, this is bad stuff. I mean, the level, the scale of the food waste problem. I, I'm going to admit this. We have been spending years on ecological interventions in agriculture that might shift the parameters positively by 4 or 5%, and we thought that was awesome. And then suddenly something like this comes along, and it's like, Great, so we were working out <clears throat> basically how organic salad mixes would shift certain parameters by this, and 75% of it isn't eaten. So, 100% of rich countries' greenhouse gas emissions come from growing food that's never eaten. 10%, sorry, 10%. If we planted trees on land currently used to grow unnecessary surplus and wasted food, this would offset a theoretical maximum of 100% of greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel combustion because, well, I'll get it to in the fourth point. Billion hungry people could be fed by a quarter of the food waste, food that's wasted in the US, UK, and Europe. Um, we are producing about 4,600 kilocalories per day of food. We're only consuming about 2,000. So if you take about half of the world's food supply and say it's being wasted, the ecological impost of that is staggering. I think the, food, the new food waste kind of politics is demonstrating that highlights one of the things we're now rethinking about the post-World War II food regime is that I mean, it, was <clears throat> it was based on quantity and cheapness and seemingly invisible ecological consequences. 
So I think this, as I'm saying, this food waste thing really is making a mockery of almost every other intervention we've been working on on the environmental dynamics of food systems. The energy, account, energy auditing that is just astonishing. All right. So <clears throat> that's not good stuff, is it? This is, and this is Hugh's happy talk. We'll get there. All right. The end of the year of cheap food, I think, potentially signals new times. This, the way in which we're suddenly in an age of austerity, we're, we're going, goodness me, you know, I'm worried about my household food budget and I was throwing a third of my food away. Perhaps I could actually, you know, think about these things a little more carefully. You know, these things change things. But we also are having, of course, inc an increasing uh, frequency of severe weather events. Um, we've got a, a massively decreasing chance of consensus on global trade negotiations. We've got dramatic shifts in government, government policy since 2008. There's no maniac austerity fever breaking out in the United States, of course, because your own political system is completely rational, um, unlike the rest of us. <clears throat> and the rise, I think, of this new more, I mean, the, the, the move towards localism has been a big deal for a long time, but the militant localism that's happened since 2008 is really interesting. So in countries like Spain, this was a million people gathering in Madrid to protest the austerity policies and bank bailouts and the sort of the whole financial crisis as was elaborating in Spain. Not really a country that was known for massive on-the-street demonstrations. So there's been a, a sense in which places are becoming radicalised that were previously out of play. Oh, so as I said, not a book tour, but this is another book we were working on about the food crisis uh, in 2009. And, you know, the, the key things that are coming out of where food sits in this crisis, if you take it up to above just the end of the year of cheap food and, and, and food waste issues, is that, you know, this, this argument that we're probably going to have to produce about twice as much food by 2050, but do it sustainably. And, and now I look at a word like sustainably, and have to start factoring in the food waste thing as part of that thing. It used to be about the way in which we produced food more sustainably. It certainly still is. But now it's also about how we manage our food systems in a way that where there is massive potential sustainability or increasing efficiency gains there. We can't rely on cheap food to drive economic growth anymore. The market liberalisation paradigm, as I've been saying, is, uh, is somewhat unravelling. And something I haven't mentioned yet is that you know, recent research suggested that the current cohort of school-aged children will be the first generation to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents because of the massive introduction of sugars into the diet of children over the last 20 years. Uh, the change in sugar profile of what, particularly say around things like beverages in the 1970s, predominant beverages drunk by children were water, juices, uh, fresh milk, uh, and tea and coffee. Well, tea and coffee in my kind of country, coffee here. Uh, and now, of course, um, I remember that we, we were visited once by the, the parents of an academic colleagues of mine from Atlanta, and he was a Coca-Cola executive. We had this dinner party, and... Uh, I said, so what are you working on? And he said, he said oh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm part of the team uh, that's working. We're not getting enough penetration into breakfast. You know, we need to get Coca-Cola products on the breakfast table more. This is our big new frontier market. This is in the 1996, he was having this thing. And, and I remember going away and saying, oh, the silly man. You know, he doesn't understand. People aren't going to drink Coca-Cola for breakfast. Yeah, I was wrong. All right. So to, to, to move me into my concluding phase. <clears throat> Obviously, the trajectory is not good. The reason we've ended up in a crisis now is because the arrows are pointing in a lot of bad directions. Uh, we know, and I think it's really important to recognise, well, I argue one thing about the current situation is that the global scale toolkit, the one-size-fits-all trade policy, you know, the, the trade liberalisation paradigm, the market uh, expansion paradigm, just isn't providing the solution that people thought it might. So the global scale toolkit isn't working anymore. And the answer possibly is not to turn around and invent a different global scale one size fits all toolkit. So do we just abandon hope? Well, I don't think we do. I think we do, however, abandon the one size fits all. I think there's something about what we have to do to respond in a situation of crisis or a potential situation of change which says we're not thinking of the replacement global paradigm for market liberalisation. We're thinking about something else because what we actually have to do is find resilient solutions which are not found in one single model. Resilient solutions are about 
uh, heterogeneous you know, multiplicity of, of many different things in play at once, interacting with each other and particularly finding those things locally. So I'm going to finish by turning to the local. And I think when we turn to the local, we have to do it positively. It's a great photo. This is, um, you may know this photo. This is a group of university students when they found out the university was going to create a new car park in a nice green field, did some guerrilla gardening and went and quickly planted a veggie garden as a form of protest against it. That's good. All right. <clears throat> why did I call this talk why food is not coal? Boy, I did not know when I came to Montana, before when I put, this, put that up in the title, what I was walking into. So now I'm going to dance my way back out of that. Uh, there's one point I want to make. It's not about coal in Montana, by the way. That would be a completely different talk. Talking about things I actually don't know much about. Uh, however, in environmental politics and policy, we are beset by what we call the no more coal problem. So what we have is uh, a situation where coal is embedded in our energy system. It's a massively important embedded feature of how we, we, we create an energy regime for a, for a lot of societies. Uh, actually, I'm going to smugly say not so much my one, but uh, certainly here. Scientifically, we know under current global climate change scenarios that we shouldn't be using it. The report that came out last week, which is ahead of the IPCC, IPCC Round 5 thing, said that Bob Watson's report basically came out and said, if we use up all the fossil fuel resources in the world, we're going to cook ourselves by about 16 degrees, and that's not survivable. As a species, we don't survive it. There's not even a, so there's not even a hard landing out of that. So at some stage, we're going to start leaving the stuff on the ground. <clears throat> the solutions that say, no, you can keep digging it up, I, I'm a foreigner to your land, I'm going to basically say bluntly, they're utopian or denialist. Um, I'm going to love it if some scientist comes up with a way to safely and cheaply sequester massive amounts of carbon dioxide of coal burning, but I'm not holding my breath. It would be very transformative if they did. Boy, if you're one of those sitting out there, go for it. However, I'm planning for the alternative reality. Uh, and we do, I mean, the frustrating thing about energy regimes is that we do have the alternatives. We have renewable alternatives in place, uh, but they are actually quite technical and demanding. So, coal, I'm, I'm going to promise that photo was not taken in Montana, because I've been told the coal trains in Montana are much longer. Um, <laughs> therefore, coal comes, becomes positioned, this is the reason I'm talking about coal, coal becomes positioned as this policy problem. It's a political problem that relies on people to accept immediate negative effects to forestall a potential future negative effect. This is the no more coal problem. And you have a massive political hill to climb to persuade people that this stuff's got to stay in the ground. Now Rick's persuaded, but he's a very unusual man. Unusually enlightened. All right, this is the classic environmental politics problem that we face in a whole lot of arenas. And I'm arguing it's not what we face in food. Food provides us with a different political scenario a different perspective scenario to the no more coal problem. And that's why food is so important for us, because rather than get to have our environmental policy and debate bogged down into these incredibly negative no more coal problems, there are actually some spaces like food where we can make really transformative changes that are quite good and quite fun. So I say that what we need to do is use food as an arena of environmental politics where we can enact positive politics because in terms of green politics, in terms of environmental policy or activism, oh, you've got to be positive. You know, it's so easy just basically get overwhelmed by the magnitude of the whole thing. So where you can be positive, you must be positive. And I think food is one of those spaces. Firstly, food is democratic. Very low barrier to entry. Anyone can basically participate in developing some kind of relationship with food at a slightly more uh, deeper level than just using it as fuel for the body. The barriers to entry are low, the skills are modest to get into a kind of new engagement with food. But as anyone who's gone to, you know, the Missoula must have, you know, home brewing associations and wine tasting clubs and all that kind of thing, the skills you develop around engaging more deeply with food do kind of elaborate in a stimulating kind of way. Or just the sheer pleasure of digging a veggie garden in your backyard. Second thing is that alternative food activities we know from food sociology are spreading beyond what 20 years ago was Hugh Campbell's income effect. You know, upper middle class academics buying organic food or going to natural food stores was the main driver in a lot of this kind of stuff. Now it's much, much, much wider than that. 
I'm letting myself off the hook. So here are the reasons why it's positive and fun. First is that food is actually tasty. Is that stating the obvious? It just has to be said, though. There's something about gustatory pleasure, which is really, really good. It's a fundamentally good human thing to experience. We love the good taste of things. And training ourselves and, and cultivating our tastes in a more ecologically tuned kind of way is, is challenging, but also very pleasurable. Second thing is we have all these kind of social movements starting to, to, start to emerge around the politics of food, a new politics of food. So the slow food movement's an excellent example a reaction against the fast food movement to say, actually, we'd like to spend more time eating food that we prepared with care, that we are trying to appreciate from our place with people that we like in our homes or collectively in the slow food movement. It's, it's been a hugely successful movement internationally. It was tapping into something, I think, that people wanted or needed to have happen. Third thing, farmers' markets are one of the most rapidly proliferating phenomena around the world for a reason. Food localism is kind of fun, and, and it is fun to go to the farmers' market. But, okay, so it becomes the socially trendy thing to do, but actually, that's a good thing. And uh, I think uh, it's probably not a case of do you go to the farmers' market in Brazil, it will be how many farmers' markets do you have? or the elaborated others, which is you know, community supporting agriculture or much more direct purchasing from local suppliers and local producers and things like that. Uh, in terms of positive food politics, does reading food labels stimulate and make us feel good about ourselves? This is where my research has been over the last 10 years. I think so. It's maybe a little hard to sell, but I think that in terms of how we now have food that arrives before us with a series of claims on it, you know, when you go to the home brewing club or the international film festival, you know, meetings and said and the other, you, you talk about things like ah, fair trade, dolphin friendly, certified organic, but what kind of organic? Am I going to still keep buying Cascadian farms? You know, they've got sold out to the corporates. You know, there is a dialogue going on about what those things are telling us. I say that it's a good thing that those messages are coming at all. You know, it's a contested arena, but it's an arena that makes it, we're better off for having it and having that ability to try and read and become more literate consumers about what's in and around and how our food's produced. My student's favourite activity, dumpster diving. Okay, this always tells you what kind of... Hands up who's done a little bit of dumpster diving in their life. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, it, uh, I ask that question at the start of a talk, I know exactly what kind of audience I'm <laughs> faced with. No hands go up, I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> what my students tell me about dumpster diving is that they love it. It's really good fun. It's a, it's a, it's a really... Yeah, it works on a whole lot of levels as to why dumpster diving is fun. Uh, this is a group of French uh, student activists who were dumpster diving every night and then coming out and laying out the food on tables in the town square for homeless people, people on benefits uh, uh, on different programs or old folk to come along and just basically pick over and you know, do the French thing uh, with their food. Huge global proliferation of urban gardening, home gardening, guerrilla gardening, these, and, and, and the sociological research into these things is that people love doing this stuff. Finally, in a university context, you can't argue that you leave just academic knowledge production out of this. So they're, they're, the world is full, my research centre back in New Zealand, the places I've been visiting, are full of academics that are stimulated, engaged, and excited about trying to work on some little bit of the wider, um, wider set of issues that we're dealing with and, and generating new academic knowledge like the academic who, who, who was examining the resilience of rice production systems, uh, how, understanding how these systems are resilient in their own terms, himself a very stimulated academic doing that kind of stuff. It's fun. It should be fun. It should be stimulating. It shouldn't be a source of hopelessness for us. To conclude, enacting a positive politics of food. All of these things about generating more resilient, locally embedded, personally connected food systems do not require us to go through the no more coal problem. They don't require us to sacrifice anything now to allow some future good to happen. In actual fact, they are intrinsically and socially highly pleasurable, which is why food is an awesome arena to get into. So, recapping my three key points. Got to escape from that linear view of history, locking into the idea that we are lemmings about to go off the cliff, that the Industrial Revolution set in path dependency, which inevitably is going to kill us. 
that we go through these periods of crisis and reformulation where particularly in terms of food relations, the whole thing gets reconfigured in these dramatic moments. Second, I think there is something I really, really hope and I postulate that we are in one of those moments where a whole lot of certainties are becoming uncertain and we are rethinking the way in which we were thinking about the global scale, one size fits all model for solving all the problems of world agriculture. And this presents opportunities and challenges for us. And finally, food provides one venue where it's not depressing and we can play out alternative futures, we can build resilience, we can build redundancy in our systems in a very, very enjoyable way. I was delighted to go onto the website and find the Thousand New Gardens Initiative in Bozeman and Missoula. Great idea. Talked to some of the people behind that last night. I think it's a really great idea. So I put that up there just to show you. This is not about a New Zealander coming and telling you guys how to do it. This is very much kind of being, I understand it's a preaching to the choir kind of talk tonight. Um, now, I've been speaking for an hour. That's my allotted time. Uh, I think if I was Ted Cruz, I'd have 20 hours to go, and I'd probably start reciting Green Eggs and Ham about now, but I won't. I'll simply say thank you to the people who've been wonderful hosts for me and brought me out to do this. Thanks very much. <clears throat>
this very extreme oppositional situation, um, probably suggests to me that if the subsidies disappeared, it would disappear. It's a protected industry. Uh, it's probably the second most, you know, after defence, there's no other industry in the world where corporations can go in and get such a free ride. Um, oh, in terms of free rides, hmm, global finance. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll stick a few of them in prison in the next 50 years. That'll solve everything. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I hope that's a sufficient answer for you. It's not an easy answer. What I think about yellow rice? What do you think about yeah. Yellow rice? <coughs> yes. Yes, I think, I mean, uh, we were in New Zealand was very involved in international debates about GMOs. We still don't have GMOs in our production systems. Uh, they don't work for us. Um, the kinds of markets we sell to don't want them. Um, and the kind of big commodity platforms that like the kind of gains you would get out of using a GMO product don't exist in New Zealand. Uh, so we've sort of been watching and participating in this debate a little cheekily from afar. Um, two things about them. I mean, one is that um, the, 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 the incredibly effective and powerful model of agriculture that emerged post-World War II had spectacular productivity gains through the 50s and 60s began levelling off a bit in the 70s. And by the 1990s, have really plateaued. I mean, the productivity gains we get out of Western agricultural, intensive agricultural systems, have been really, really hard won recently, in the last decades. I mean, every agricultural scientist knows this is what we're up against within intensive farming systems. Um, and GMOs, I think, were the next attempt, you know, the next genuine attempt out of agricultural science to try and bump that plateau up again and say, how much more can we get out of the system? I think the introduction of GMOs would have been a completely different phenomena if it hadn't happened within a, such a um, corporatised agricultural situation. I mean, I, I think a, a massive amount of the resistance to GMOs is actually the resistance to who owns GMOs. Um, it would have been a fascinating experiment in public agriculture had uh, new varieties been held in public trust or by university trusts and distributed through completely different mechanisms without the royalty implications and the like within a more considered testing regime, the whole progression of the technology might have been different. Might have been. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting thought. However, we have a Western agricultural problem indicated by why we went after GMOs, and that is that our productivity level has been plateauing. Um, and environmental scientists like Jules Pretty, uh, who's sort of a, a leading voice on sort of a, a, undertaking a sort of more meta-analysis globally about where we go with global agriculture, says, look, forget it in the West. We're going to have to produce twice as much food to, and do it sustainably to feed the world by 2050. You're not going to do it in Iowa or New Zealand. The place where there will be there is massive potential for uptake of agricultural productivity and different styles of agriculture is in the developing world. There, even simple technologies have massive positive impacts on food systems. He said, "So you know, our world food problem uh, is is twofold. It's it's really saying that we've been you know, since World War II we've been trying to drive world food." We're trying to solve world food hunger by growing the food probably in the worst places to grow it. Yeah, we, well, it wasn't actually. It was a very useful place to grow it, but we're just not growing so much of it there anymore. The growth potential lies in those untapped resources in the developing world. Um, and, and, and the agricultural scientists I work with sort of, perhaps I have a slightly biased sample, but it's sort of saying, you know, we're just not so interested in trying to make New Zealand sheep farming that productive anymore. It's not really where the game is anymore. We want to use our skills and our understandings. We want to use integrated pest management, all this kind of stuff, to work out how to make systems in other countries work better and, and, and potentially downscale it to a more small scale. OK, that's the rant over. Thanks very much for the question. <laughs> the, yes, no, no, it was, sorry, I was, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll be next.
it totally blew me away too. Yeah. Uh, It's, yeah, look, it's a really challenging question because, I mean, it, when the waste thing began hitting our radar screen, um, here I was, I'd been leading a project that some describe as the largest farm-scale study of sustainable production in the world. You know, it's a 15 million US dollar project. It'd been going for 10 years. We had over 100 farms and a longitudinal study. And you go, yeah, we found out some awesome modest changes. You know, and then suddenly something else comes along and says, yeah, and how trivial is that? compared to, and I found it really quite challenging. I think the thing about, I mean, and one of the things, the, the book that we flashed up, that I flashed up there, was this movement of food waste as a political and a cultural problem from what we argue to be a reasonably invisible status post-World War II, certainly not invisible pre-World War II, depression era and before, managing food waste, managing food leftovers, cooking leftovers, how you basically made, you know, Mrs. Beaton's cookbook is three quarters about how you utilise the leftovers from the previous meal. You know, it was embedded in the way in which we culturally related to food was, you don't waste this stuff. Uh, and I think, you know, my, my grandfather's generation of farmers um, really were very careful about the fact that it was, it was not a good thing to be wasting stuff at the point of production. And then post-World War II, we just kind of... Like, the, like, the, like the, the invisible food genie just came along and bang, it's gone. Suddenly out of our cultural context, it's not saying it's completely gone, but it just didn't seem to be that big a deal. And in a world of, a, a, in our world, awash with abundant cheap food, it's kind of like, um, not such a big deal. And now it is. And I think it's really been so recent that we are struggling to know or assemble our responses to it. The fascinating thing is for some households when they come across the waste stuff, they go, oh, <clears throat> you know, I never really thought about that. We're under financial pressure. I'm going to be much more careful at the supermarket now about what I buy. And, and, and they report, but we had a, I had a master's student who just finished a master's thesis about you know, talking, doing focus groups over a period of time with supermarket shoppers in a, you know, a modest socioeconomic suburb in my hometown. And they came back and said, you know, he said, it's incredible how much money we saved. It's like giving up smoking. You know, and he said it was all about, you know, and they said we were going up and down the supermarket aisles, whereas before we thought about this, it was about what's the cheapest stuff to buy, because we're, we're pressed. And then it was what's the cheapest stuff to buy, plus how much of it do we actually need? And it's like, it just seemed, it just seemed crazy. It seemed so obvious. And there's something childlike about the current wonder about waste. What, what were we missing all this time? So I think in terms of responses, it is, it's, it's a curiously interesting phenomenon because it has implications for responses at every level of governance down to the individual. I'm not someone who politically and intrinsically likes the idea that personal choices change the world. In this case, I've got to admit that, yeah, actually personal behaviour could change a lot in this. But at other steps in the chain, it, it's probably quite uh, uh, important as well. Um, the UK government has moved to uh, ban supermarkets from dumping food waste into landfill. So they now have to, they have to take their food waste to biodigesters and produce biogas. That at least is a more responsible use of it than just ploughing it into the ground. Um, the European Union has toyed with the idea that they should be eliminating food standards that, 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 are, that require food to be taken out at harvest simply for cosmetic reasons. The bendy carrot problem. They didn't actually quite enact that, but they've been thinking about it. So we're just starting to think about how we respond to food waste. I, and I think your ideas and suggestions on this are just as valid as mine. Yeah. We have time for one more. And, and this gentleman here had his hand up faithfully, waiting. I hope it's a nice question. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Food, food plus water. Yeah. Ooh. It's a hard banana to unpeel. 
I mean, and I think it's, it's worth saying that one of the reasons why the WHO seems to have stalled in terms of its agenda is that it's, it's the rise of these, the, the BRICS countries have become incredibly powerful. I and mean, suddenly, you know, the Brazils and the Russias and the Indies and Chinas, uh, they have a much more powerful voice in those kinds of economic discussions than was the case 10 years ago, or uh, well, 15 years ago. Um, and that's a very, it's an interesting thing to see how they are emerging. I think we're not doing much to stop or, 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 or help that at all. It's just fascinating to see certain countries that have been powerful voices in these discussions for a very long time finding that we're not actually quite that powerful anymore. New Zealand, I mean, one of the things about the collapse of the WTO process has been this move towards bilaterals, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's trying to assemble itself. And it's been shocking uh, for New Zealand, which has been a massive free trade advocate through the WTO, have to rethink its position over the last five years. And New Zealand negotiated in 2010 a free trade deal with China. It was unthinkable under WTO rules. And what China required of New Zealand to get a free trade agreement was a whole range of requirements uh, that would never have got through the WTO. Nevertheless, China and New Zealand seem to be kind of getting on a bit at the moment. We occasionally sell them some dodgy infant formula, but apart from that, um, you know, there's actually been the elaboration of a, of a whole lot of activity around that discussion. And now the Trans-Pacific Partnership's come along. The US is coming along and saying, right, OK, New Zealand, sign up, and you're basically not like going to be, you're not going to be able to sue any of our agribusiness corporations. You can't take Monsanto to court. You can't do this, that, and the other. And New Zealand's going, well, actually, we've got our free trade deal with China. We're probably not quite so interested anymore. And it's astonishing to see the diminishment of the role of certain countries in those discussions and the rise of those others as players. Now, not all of those others that are rising are benign others, but the rules in a situation of crisis are changing. I just tack on because you're going to stop me now, aren't you? Food is a really positive place to experiment and think about alternative futures in a fun and positive kind of way. The actual future ecologically of the planet will be about the great energy regime debates. Food's related to that, and food is driven out of the cost of energy. But the game for the next 50 years, the food game will be fun, but the energy regime discussions will be absolutely fundamental to our survival.